All right, before we get started with the sermon, keep your place here. Turn if you would to Psalm 37. I just want to make a point on something that just, just happened here. If you didn't get a chance to listen to my, to my Wednesday night sermon, I encourage you to do so. There's actually, um, turns, turns out to be very similar with what I'm going to be talking about just for a second here right now. Um, I talk about blessed is him that, you know, that, that considereth the poor, right? And that was what Wednesday night kind of had a main focus on. And I preached a lot about giving and stuff which is a good thing to do. And, and look, I believe in giving. I believe in helping the poor. But if you remember, if you didn't see, if you didn't catch it, I talk about considering the cause of the poor too and considering why they're in their condition. There's a difference between the poor and the bum. Okay, there's a difference between the poor and the wicked person who's out to try to just get your money and try to guilt you into giving you money and they're not willing to go off to work and they're not willing to go off and support themselves and they just want to take your money, okay? And we just had a gentleman walk into the door, into the church today, just basically expecting a handout and just coming in and just going, give me money, okay? And as I mentioned before, it's just like the people who call up down the list and say, oh, I need this and I need that. This guy comes in asking for money. And look, the reason why I'm fired up about this because people do this all the time and they try to guilt Christians into giving them money and try to turn the scripture against you and try to make you think, oh, you're so cold and you don't, you know, you have no compassion and you're a hypocrite and you don't believe the, you know, all this other nonsense that they want to throw at you. When really, and because this guy's saying, oh, I know, he wouldn't even let me quote a Bible verse to him. He says, I know the Bible. I know the Bible. And trying to tell me why I'm not wrong for just opening up my wallet and going, oh, you said you want to have this money? Here's all this money. Without even questioning and without even considering the cause that he's coming in here for. And I said, hey, why don't you sit down with us? You know, the service is going on right now. Why don't you come in and sit down and I'll see what we could do about helping you after the service? Well, no, no, you know, that's no good, right? And I quoted him, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, I know the Bible. Okay, watch out for these crooks and these wicked people. I'll tell you what, that guy is a wicked man and he came in here lying to me. And you say, Pastor Rose, how do you know he was lying to you? He told me this story about he's here from Puerto Rico and his car broke down and he needs a battery and you know, he has all these details and it costs this much and I'm only you know, $28 short. And this, this whole story, right? Because that's what these liars like to do is just try to convince you with a multitude of words, but we know in a multitude of words there wanteth not sin. Brother Mark just told me, he says, yeah, that guy, I just, I ran into the same exact guy yesterday. He had the same exact story, same exact amount of money. Do you mean to tell me not one person has given you a dollar, a quarter, anything in an entire day of begging people? It was last Sunday. I thought it was yesterday when you were here for the preaching class. That's, that's even a week ago. It's been an entire week. What have you been living on, man? You still can't get 20 bucks? He's a liar. That's right. He's a liar. And he comes in, he tries to intimidate people. He tries to make you think, oh, I need to be given. You, you know what? You don't need to be given to liars and crooks like that. Amen. He's a wicked person. You know what the Bible says here? Look at Psalm 37, verse number 25. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Righteous people, righteous people aren't going to be begging bread. You say, well, Pastor Bersons, anyone can become poor. Yes, anyone can become poor. But you know what? God is going to take care of the righteous person. People could lose everything. And God will make sure that that person is taken care of where you don't have to beg for bread. Elijah didn't have to beg. God took care of Elijah in a famine when everybody was poor. Okay, the righteous don't have to beg. Now look, 
listen to my sermon on Wednesday because I don't want to re-preach this entire sermon. Because I do believe in giving. And I do believe in helping people. And I do believe in having compassion on people and, and, and helping out those that are poor. And yes, giving financially, giving money to help people in need. But we need to consider the cause and not be swindled by crooks and wicked people that are out there that are just coming in to get a free handout and they're bums. And this was a well-able body man and you know what he is? He's a stinking bum. And he deserves nothing. And I gave him an opportunity. Look, it's Sunday morning. You're worried about a car battery it's Sunday morning, you walked into a church, and instead of walking in and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, you tell me, oh, I know the Bible. If you know the Bible, then why are you forsaking the assembling? That's right. That's right. And I've said this before, you know, I don't make these promises as if, well, if you stay here, I'll give you this much money. I want to see where their heart is. Because I am willing to help people out, especially if they're going to say, you know what? Yeah, I really ought to be in church right now. And if that man would have said all those things, even though he's a liar or not, like I didn't know I got that extra information, you know, I, I pretty much thought he was, but as soon as I, you know, it's like you hear these stories over and over again, you try to give people the benefit of the doubt, but if you see someone's heart is in the right place and you're trying to do what's right, great. But if you don't have that right, no amount of money is going to help you. And if you run across this guy, it's another reason why I'm bringing it up, don't give him anything. If he accosts you in the parking lot, say, get out of here. You're not welcome here. Amen. You get your heart right with God. If you want to come to church, you are welcome to come to church. But do not be just asking a bunch of people for money here because that's not what we do. You need to get right with God and then see if God's going to help you. Because right now, you're under the chastisement of God. Well, the guy's not even saved, so he's, you know, he's not a son being chastised. These guys, because you know what we try to do? We try to give people the gospel because that's way more, again, that's way more important even than the money. But he didn't want to listen. He didn't want to learn. He doesn't want to do the right thing. So guess what? You're not going to get any help. But listen to my sermon on Wednesday, and it goes into more scripture and more detail into why that's the case and everything like that. So... Uh, anyways, interesting. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, turn back, if you would, to Exodus. I want to get into the, the actual sermon for this morning. That was just a, a, an appetizer. <laughs> Time for the main course. All right, Exodus chapter 8. I preached on Exodus last week, and as Brother Brian was very astute, he says, Pastor Bersons, I know where you are in your Bible reading. <laughs> when you start preaching sermons, and you're like, yeah, I, I figured you were right around that chapter, right? Yep. So, um, but that's how a lot of my sermon ideas come from. They come from my personal Bible reading, uh, come across things. So um, there's a topic I want to preach on. I mentioned this briefly last week, but I want to get into more detail on it now. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at these passages in Exodus chapter 8 and, and forward of uh, Pharaoh's reaction to Moses and really the word of God, right? But Moses comes in, let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. And in the course of this, um, Pharaoh at first, he's not budging, right? But as the plagues become worse and worse, he starts to crack. And you'll see, and we're going to look at these specifically. And he starts trying to give stipulations, going, okay, okay, I'm going to let you go, but. But you're going to do it my way, right? I'll let you go, but no, we're not going to do this. Let's look down here at verse number 25. The Bible says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. So this is what they're asking for, right? We need to go. We need to sacrifice to the Lord. You know, they, they said, we need to be let go to do this. So now he's finally cracking. He's saying, okay, go. Verse 26. And Moses said, it is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. 
Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? So he says, go sacrifice to your God in the land. He's saying, well, you can't leave. Just go do your sacrifice here. Right? Just do your sacrifice, whatever you need to do. And Moses explains, look, this is what we need to do is an abomination to the Egyptians. I mean, they hate this. They're not going to tolerate us doing this just right in front of their eyes. Right? You've got two different cultures living here. You've got the Hebrews and you've got the, the native Egyptians that two different gods, two, you know, everything's pretty different in their culture. So they're saying they won't tolerate this. So he tells them, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness. Look at this. Only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. So now he's still saying like, well, no, it's going to be this way. And Moses said, behold, I go out from thee and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants and from this people tomorrow. But let the, not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And then down at verse number 32, it says, And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither will he let the people go. So he still doesn't do it. Right? He's trying to say, okay, well, will you do it. Do it this way. Do it this way. Flip over to chapter 10. We're going to see one more um, example of this. And we're not going through all the examples. This is just, just two. I want to point this out to, get the, to really get the point across. Verse number 7. The Bible reads, And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? So now, at this point, Pharaoh's servants are going like, Look, this land is becoming desolate just because of all the plagues and everything that, that has been done by not letting them go. And they're saying, like, just let them go. Right? Just, just let them do this thing because... Then all of Egypt is being destroyed. Verse 8 says, And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? He's still not good enough just to say, Go. He said, But wait a minute now. Who are you talking about here? Verse 9 says, And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. Will we go? For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. He's saying basically, everybody and everything. We've got to bring all our animals. We're bringing all the kids. We're, you know, everybody's going. We've got a feast unto the Lord. Verse 10, And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. And then in verse 11, he says, Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord. For that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So he's saying, and then he's, he's just, he's just flip-flopping. He's going, you know what? No, I'm not going to let you all go. Just the men. He's like, that's what you asked me for before. That's what you wanted. So that's all I'm going to give you. And then jump down to verse number 24. The Bible says, And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So, that, so then he's still giving back a little bit more but he's still trying to keep control over all of this. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices, burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Now, what I'm preaching on this morning, you know, it's great. It's a great story. And Moses is a great leader, and there's a lot of things we could learn from this. But I want to take this, and I want you to think about and consider this story from not just from a story perspective, but kind of put yourself in the shoes. What we see Moses doing here is not compromising. He's being offered multiple times to have a resolution, to have an end to this struggle. And what I want you to, to think about is it's great when you read the stories of people doing great things and being solid and being firm and not backing down and not compromising. But sometimes we fail to realize all that may be going on internally during those situations. So we can look at it and say, this is how we need to be. Amen and amen. 
but you need to think about and consider the pressure that is on a person, any human being, to want to end resolutions, but we also need to understand the importance of not compromising when it comes to the things of God and the things that are right and wrong. Now, I'm sure but Moses didn't want to, from the beginning, he didn't want to be a spokesman, right? He was taking on this, this role. God had you know, ordained him to do this, and he was doing it. But he was not the most confrontational person. In fact, he was a very meek person. So for anybody in a position, I mean, you, he also has people hating on him too. His own people were getting upset and getting angry and why are you causing waves and now things are worse for us and now you know they're making us do more work and and you brought this all on us when he's out there like working for them working for the benefit he's got all these people hating him he's not in a good position and you know what when you stand up to do what's right oftentimes you won't be in a good position if you stand up on principle you may get a lot of people hating you and people that don't even realize when you make decisions for their own good this is, you know, as a side note, this is one of the reasons why pure democracies aren't a good idea. Because the majority, oftentimes, don't even realize what's best for them. And you end up with mob rule and you end up getting things where people just want to satisfy their lusts and their desires. And the more wicked a society becomes, the worse it becomes. Which is why, in a, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not advocating necessarily for you know, even our system of government, because there's a lot of things that are wicked, but the, the, the concept of having a representative government is you have someone who's supposed to be you know, making decisions on principle with integrity so that you can, you can say, okay, this is a just person, this is a righteous person, so we're gonna trust their judgment in making good decisions that's gonna affect a lot of people you know, to do the right thing. And when you have someone who does that, a lot of times you're gonna have a lot of people that hate that person and will complain about it because they don't see the end. They don't, they don't realize, yeah, it's gonna be, it may be painful now, but see, when people don't wanna experience any level of discomfort and any level of pain, you know, you just are so focused on the instant, on the moment, and you have no foresight and no vision then you end up with problems and with people who try who have the foresight who have the vision see we live and we should be walking by faith faith means you know it's something that's not seen yet we're seeing it we believe it we know it to be true but we're not necessarily reaping the benefits right now so in because we know that and because we walk by faith we're going to go through some hard times and experience some things that may not be comfortable for us in the short term because we know the long term. Moses knew this with the children of Israel. Hey, it may not be comfortable right now. We're going to have a lot of people hating us. Moses is going to be fighting against us. There's going to be adversaries. But in the end, hey, there's this promised land. The Lord promised it. So he's going to give it to us. And he's going to see us there and he's going to let us get there and, and it's going to be great. But we have to walk by faith. And Moses was in this situation and he's, you know, you've got a lot of pressure. Let's face it, especially as a leader, you got a lot of pressure from people trying to get you to just stop the pain. Right? And people just want everything, just, just, just fix this immediate need right now. Just like the guy that came in, if his story was true, oh, just fix this immediate need right now. This is what I need. No, it's not what you need. It's not what you need. You need something a lot more. Now, you don't like to hear that because you think you just need the immediate attention right now. But there's something that's better for you. And the pressure comes in when you have people, you know, going, no, 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 we need this now, we need this now. And that's when the pressure comes in to compromise. And especially when you have these offers here and you've got, you know, Pharaoh is basically offering to end all this. Okay, but you just got to do that. Just, just give me something here, you know, 
I, I need to save face. You can't just come in here demanding things because if you just demand everything and I just give you everything then everyone's going to walk all right because that would be Pharaoh's perspective. Let a, I mean, obviously it doesn't help that he's just an unsaved heathen that, who is the Lord. I mean, that was his, pro that was his problem. His problem isn't the people and what are the people going to do. His problem is not knowing the Lord. But he's got this thing. So he's, you know, he's trying to get, save some face and whatever. Well, you just, because there was no reason why they couldn't go any further. You know, he's just trying to exert control and power. Obviously, we can't just give in to that, even though the temptation may be very great to do so, because you just want things to end. Moses walked by faith. He was dedicated to following exactly what God had commanded him to do. And God is a God that, you know, when he makes commandments and when he tells us to do something, you do it. There's no, there's no middle ground there. It's not like, well, you, I know you said to do this, but you know, I, I, I went 90% of the way. You no, know, he wants you to do it all. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and otherwise, it's not satisfactory. It's not, it's not done. Moses didn't grow weary of the fight and try to end it early and hope God would just be pleased with his compromise. Like, well, at least you made it that far. That's not the way God works. Or hope that God would just understand. Well, I'm just weak, God. He'll understand. It was just too hard for me to endure that pressure. These are the, the moments when you're going to have the most pressure are going to be the defining moments for your life. And let that sink in because... When things are going great, you typically don't have the defining moments as much. It's when the pressure builds up, when you have stress, when you kind of get in the middle of something where you've got decisions to make. And especially when you know what's right, but you're being tempted to compromise, to end things early, to just be done with this, to just put it in compromise. The devil attacked Jesus. You can turn to Matthew 4 if you'd like when he was weak, right? Physically weak, because he was out fasting in the desert. And when you're fasting, physically you're gonna end up being weaker. Because you're withholding food from yourself, obviously. Look at, um, Verse number one in Matthew chapter four, the Bible reads, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. So he's hungry. I mean, it's been 40, day, 40 days of no food. It's a long time. It's a long, that's over a month of not eating. His physical, I mean, he was physically a human being, right? He's God in the flesh, but he still has that flesh that has the same needs that our flesh has. He needs sustenance. He needs food, physically speaking. So 40 days, yeah, he's hungry. This is when Satan comes to tempt him. Verse number three says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This would be a compromise where you can say, oh, well, you know, you're challenging me. I can show you I'm the son of God and I can eat. So he's trying to get him to do something that he's going to want to do anyways. He wants to eat. He's not, you know, this very first one is so subtle. He's not trying to get him to do something necessarily at this point that's just completely obvious wrong, right? He's subtly just going, well, why don't you just make the, you know, you say you're the son of God. Why don't you prove it and make this some bread? He's been fasting for 40 days, but he answers with the word of God. He answers by faith, basically just saying, no, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. Verse number five says, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and saith him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So he's saying, see, 
He's like, why don't you just throw yourself down? It doesn't matter. God's already promised to protect you. So, you know, the angels are going to come. They'll be going to make sure that no harm comes to you. And um, why don't you just do it? And that's just kind of a foolish temptation anyways, because why would you just do anything just because, you know, like, well, none's going to happen anyways. Well, why would I just do that? It makes no sense. And Jesus said unto him, verse 7, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Like, why are you going to test him? Don't, don't be testing God like that. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Obviously, Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is perfect. And um, he doesn't succumb to any of Satan's temptations. But what we learn from this is, is how Satan works, too. Obviously, the Son of Man is sinless. But we see how Satan works here in attacking with various methodologies, going, one, trying to appeal to your physical lusts of, like, you know, just even just food and sustenance and saying, hey, you can do this. How about this? I'm, you know, I have needs. I'm poor, I could just go out and lie to people and tell them a story and they'll give me some money. Well, I need food. Hey, that's quick and easy. How about you don't compromise though because the word of God says not to bear a false witness and the word of God says, you know, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things should be added unto you. Walk by faith that God will take care of you when you give heed to his word and not compromise to meet some other need, some other lust, some other fleshly desire. You know, the, the devil is tempting Jesus with all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, Jesus knows he's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to inherit a kingdom far better than what Satan can offer him anyways. And either way, even if he didn't have that inheritance, he still knew it's not right. You need to worship the Lord God. Right? He didn't just do it because he knew he had a kingdom. He, just, he didn't do it because it wasn't right. And we need to not compromise and not allow ourselves to be tempted into these things. The compromise that Pharaoh was trying to make with Moses was targeting Moses while he was doing the right thing. Right? So turn, turn if you would, to, uh, to James 1. Turn to James 1. So Moses was, was on a mission to, to actually serve the Lord and do right. And, what's, and, and what, was, what Pharaoh was trying to do was just to get him to back off a little bit. Right? Moses, you're doing the right thing. How about you just tone it down a little bit? How about you just scale it back a little bit? You know, I don't want you to do this. I'm going to stand up and oppose you from doing this thing. But you know what? If you do it this way, then I'll back off. Right? That's one way of being pressured to compromise. And you could apply this in so many different ways. You know, hey, I, 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 if you go out and, and knock on people's doors and ask them if they know for sure they're going to have it, you know, I'm against that. Don't do that. You, you know, you can't do that to people. But, you know, you can still share the gospel if you do it this way. Why don't you just mail them what you wanted to say and, and then that'll be okay. Why don't you just send them a postcard and then that'll be okay? How about no? How about the Bible says preach the gospel to every creature? How about, you know, we follow the commandment of the Lord and not just say, oh, well, hey, I'm still doing something good. I'm still trying to reach people. You know, people are giving me a hard time about this, so I'll just, you know, go along to get along and I'll just compromise a little bit here. But I could still do good things, right? I mean, what if Moses said that? Hey, I could, we could still offer some sacrifices. Maybe it's not all of us. Maybe it's not in the location that God said. But you know what? We can still do some good things and we could still get some good work done. And now we won't have any more problems with Pharaoh. And maybe Pharaoh will be our buddy. And maybe one day he'll see eye to eye with us. How about no? That may, that, that, those are the types of thoughts or ideas that are wicked, that are going to get you to do the wrong thing and compromise on God's word. Just because you're feeling pressure and you want something to end, you need to stick with God's word and stick with the right way of doing it all the way through. And, and don't fall into this snare of thinking, well, maybe, you know, if we do it this way, 
and you're, and you're cutting back on the right way, if we do things this way, we'll attract more people. Churches do this. You know, the pastor says, why do you guys sing these old hymns and you read that old Bible? Why don't you just make things a little bit newer, a little bit more exciting? You know, these, this young generation, they need to be, they need, we need some lights going on in here. We need a smoke machine. We need to do something to get things, you know, a little bit more lively and interesting. And you need, you know, if you want to get more people in here, you know, these, these songs, they have too much doctrine in them. They say too many things. They make too many bold stands. You need to just, just mellow that out a little bit and make it more generic so you could just get more people in here. And then over time, you can work with them and get them to see. You. No, no. It doesn't work that way. You know what that makes you? A compromiser. You know what that makes you? A hypocrite. You know what that makes you? Is someone who has no integrity. If you believe something, then go with it. Believe it. Don't be ashamed about it. Don't be ashamed of the word of God. Don't hold back. Don't cut back. Just this is what it says and this is what I believe and this is what we're going to do because it's the right thing to do. And it's either going to attract people or repel people. It doesn't matter to me. Because this is what's right. This is what we do. Amen. I'm not going to get distracted with any other things and any other reasons for compromising on the word of God. Now, that's from the perspective of when you're doing something right and people are trying to get you to compromise and back off and don't do things this way or don't do things that way. Look, this is the Bible way of doing it. This is the way we're going to do it. And we will not budge on that. But there's another way that we could be tempted to compromise. Instead of holding off on doing good things, it's getting into things that we shouldn't be getting into. There's a lot of people that do a good job of getting sin out of their life and setting up boundaries and setting up rules. But then it may be years and then temptation comes along. Well, maybe I'll start bending a little bit on this. And usually it happens when, you know, the flesh creeps up and tries to convince you to toe the line. Well, you know, I know you don't really want to get into sin, but why don't you get right over here? Just, just get that little taste. Don't open that door. Look at James 1, verse number 13. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Oftentimes people allow themselves to be tempted with sin and that, look, we all have the flesh. That's still here. Okay, until Jesus Christ comes back, we're stuck with this flesh. But we also have the spirit. Now, the flesh is going to make you want to lust after sinful things. But we can't give any leeway or any ground to those fleshly lusts because that's the conception then of that lust. And now you're bringing forth sin. We need to fight against that flesh, that fleshly lust, and not allow yourself to compromise your standards just for a, that taste of sin. Because just that little taste, just that little bit, oh man, I remember this, I remember that, I, you know, I did this, I just want some of that again. It's going to lead you down a path that you're going to end up going way farther down than you ever intended on going. There, we have examples of this in Scripture that I believe people, you know, they started off having maybe good rules, living righteously or whatever, and having a good mind about things, and just slowly opened up the door and allowed things to just play with an idea, toy with an idea. A good example, turn if you would to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Second Samuel 13 is the story of Amnon, one of David's sons. And he allowed himself 
to toy with this idea of something that was wicked and sinful and wrong. But his flesh was driving him in this direction. And instead of just, you know, for a long time, I assume for a long time, I don't know exactly how long, but for a time he was, nope, can't do it, can't think of anything like this. But he's got this friend that gives him some bad ideas and is a bad influence on his life. And then he starts opening up this door, right? And he ends up going way further than he probably even intended on going and it had disastrous consequences in his life and other lives around him. Look at verse number one, Second Samuel 13, the Bible reads, and it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So Amnon just, he like falls in love with his sister because it's half sister, but still a sister. And obviously the Bible forbids this and obviously this is wrong. And we all know this today. I'm not going to go and explain on why this is wrong. But in his flesh, he's got this extra love for his sister than, than he ought to have. Verse number two says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister. Tamar fell sick means like he's, he's lovesick, right? He's, he's, um, he's got this problem. It says, For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So at this point, he says, But you know what? That would be like, like, it would be too hard. Like, I, I can't do anything. And he set up the, like, like, no, can't do this. Can't cross that line. You know, he thought it too hard to do anything about this. He wasn't going to take any action. He's like, this is the way it feels. He, he understands that, but he's saying, you know what? Not going to do it. But he's got this bad influence in his life. Verse number three says, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. So Jonadab here is representing Satan with his subtlety that's going to come in and try to get him to compromise on his boundaries, get him to compromise on, on his stance against doing something wicked. And he doesn't just go right off the bat and say, hey, why don't you just go and force your sister Tamar? Because he wouldn't fall for that. But what he does is he tries to get him and entice him to compromise, to put himself in a situation where now it's going to be a lot harder for him to control his flesh and to, and to you know, control that situation. See, what we have here, when you have something, some wicked desire, the best thing for you to do is to Re remove all opportunity for that desire to be fulfilled, right? So men, ladies, you know, if you're married and you have a wicked desire for someone who's not your spouse, you need to set up rules so you don't have opportunity for that desire ever to come to fruition. So what you don't do is well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, because what too many people do, well, I'm just going to flirt with this person a little bit. I'm just going to talk to them. I'm just going to get friendly. I'm not going to do anything, right? I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to cheat on my husband. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. But I, I have this feeling. And people choose to try to toe that line, right? And kind of see how close they could get and have fun and, and, and start going down that path but that's the path that leads to destruction and adultery and divorce and, and all manner of wickedness. What you need to do if you spot something like that is you say, you know what, I'm going to make sure this never happens. And I'm gonna not even going to talk to that person. Because I've got a wicked desire in my heart that needs to get fixed. And this flesh, you know, I'm going to overcome this flesh with the spirit and say, I'm not even going to put that in the realm of possibility of happening so if I'm ever find myself in a situation, I'm never going to allow myself to be alone with that person or, you know, I'm just going to cut contact because that's wicked and I need to get right with God. And I would go even further than that in general is even before you have that wicked desire in your heart is to not allow yourself to build close friendships when you're married with people of the opposite gender to even 
even allow for that opportunity to build some special bond with someone other than your spouse to guard against the adultery that could very easily happen. Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything. And he didn't make this plot and his plan, but you know what? When he heard it, he was willing to compromise. Look at what happened in verse number four. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being a king's son, lean from day to day? Basically, you shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be sad. You shouldn't have it. You're the king's son. You're better than this. Just trying to, to, to puff him up. Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. Oh, while well, you love her? Well, here's a great opportunity for you to spend more time with her. Right? Now, this wicked friend Jonadab doesn't tell him to do anything overtly sinful other than pretending, you know, lying, pretending to be sick, right? But he's not, he's not telling him to force her, but what he's doing is he's opening up this opportunity. He's getting him to compromise. He's putting this thought in his eye. Like, oh, wow, yeah, if I do this, then she'll come and, and care for me and nurture me. And, you know, I love her. But now what he's doing is he's, he, I mean, he had, he was lovesick over this girl and he put himself in a bad situation where now he's in bed and he has this woman that he's lusting after come into his bedroom to be alone with him together in the bedroom. Not the position you want to find yourself in. Okay. And look, I was, I brought up married people. How about unmarried people? How about you're dating someone, you're seeing someone. Don't put yourself in a situation, you have feelings for someone, where you allow yourself to be in a bedroom or be in a house alone together. No one else is around, and you're just in this room, in this house, with no one else. Look, that's a bad situation to be in. That's going to allow for the rise of the temptation to commit fornication. Look, fornication is a wicked sin. Fornication is a sin that's going to get you kicked out of this church. The Bible says, put away from your yourselves that wicked person. It, it, you know, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth, you know, um, every sin, but he that committed fornication <laughs> sinned against his own body, right? So I, why, don't I, why is I drawing a blank on that verse? It's wicked. It's wrong. And you should not allow yourself the opportunity to succumb to those fleshly desires because they're real. Uh, so the Bible says here, verse 6, we'll close this out. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes on the side. Let me eat it. And I'm not going to go into the rest of this, but he ends up forcing her. It's a really bad story. And he ends up hating her. And it's, it's just this horrible situation, horrible sin, unthinkable sin. Which never would have happened if he didn't compromise and open up that door just because he wanted to get as close as he could to that sinful act. And just, oh man, yeah, I could be so close. Don't, don't toe the line. It's a lot harder. So we got, we got this line in the carpet up here, right here at the front row. It's a lot harder for me to cross that line when I'm way back here. Yeah. Right? I mean, I have to put forth a lot of effort to get to that point of getting way over on the other side of this line. But you know what? If I'm right here, like, hey, this is pretty fun. Oops. We shouldn't be playing around with sin, especially as children of God. You know, Brother Devin preached a great sermon yesterday at the preaching class on just reverencing God, reverencing his name. And, you know, people ought to have a healthy fear of God. And as children of God, we ought to as well. If you fear God, you're not going to toe that line and flirt around with, 
getting into sin. And not only, you know, obviously for your own chastisement and punishment, but you know what? When you sin, you impact other people. Amnon did horrible damage to multiple people. To his sister, first and foremost, but also to his father with other relatives. I mean, this just impacted a whole bunch of people. His other brother who took in Tamar, right? Absalom took in Tamar as a result of this. I mean, just so many people's lives are impacted by this one compromise and allowing this to go forward. And you know, when you, when you make that compromise, it may not happen the first time, but then that's just going to embolden you to toe the line even closer. Say, well, I didn't sin this time. Yeah. Then you're going to keep going down that path because you're going to think it's safe. And it's not. Turn, if you would, to James, back to James 1. I should have you put a bookmark on James 1. One more story we have from 1 Kings chapter 11. The Bible reads, But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in unto them. Neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And that was his downfall. And, and you know, no, having no respect for the word of God, and starting to toe that line, starting to compromise. Here's someone who, and you can read about it in Ecclesiastes, you know, he withheld nothing from his eyes that he wanted. And unfortunately, he allowed that to spill over into women. Because he didn't withhold those desires as he should have. And it ended up being his downfall and thinking like, oh, well, this isn't that big of a deal. Well, I'm the king. I should have... You know, just like he was probably having a similar to, uh, advice like John had. Oh, well, you're the king. You have all these riches. You, you're entitled to this. You're not entitled to break the, the word of the Lord. You're not entitled to break his commandments. It says he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. I bet he never thought when he was lusting after these women and marrying them, he never thought that he would just be now building altars unto other gods at the time. I don't think he was. I mean, he built the altar unto the Lord. He built the temple, right? He, he had a lot of great works under his belt for the Lord. He, you know, penned down most of the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Right? I mean, he was used of God mightily. He was on the right path. He was doing a lot of great things. And at the time of his marriages to these other women that he just couldn't withhold himself from, I'm sure he wasn't thinking in the future, I'm just going to be rearing up all these altars of false gods to satisfy them. But the things that you think now, man, how wicked would that be? The path there... It really doesn't take that much. It starts off with that first compromise. And before you know it, you end up in a place, man, I never thought I would do that. Solomon probably never thought he'd be rearing up an altar to a false god. And honestly, I, I think Amnon never thought he was going to be forcing his sister. I don't think that he really necessarily wanted to do that. I think he ended up allowing himself to get in this position. And he let his, the lust of his flesh just take over. Then it was too much for him to control and he ended up committing that wicked sin. Yes, it was plotted and planned for her getting there and everything. And again, I don't know the intentions. It's speculation, but I do know the way that, that flesh works and human sinful nature works. And when we open up that door of opportunity, bad things are going to happen. It's inevitable. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't think so highly of yourself. Well, I would never do that. 
I've got personal testimonies myself, and I'm not going to go into those. I don't feel like confessing all my sins to you this morning, okay? But there are, there are a few different things that I, that, you know, earlier in my life, I've been like, no way would I ever do that. That later on, through, you know, a series of, of compromises, right. well, it's not that bad. Well, okay, well... All of a sudden, here you are going, huh, didn't think I'd be here. But you think you can take it. Oh, this isn't that bad. You justify it. You give in to the, to the temptation and you make compromises in your life. Oh, I could handle it. Oh, you know, I know Pastor Burns is talking about this, you know, having rules about not, you know, married and, and not making all these friendships and close friends. But I can handle it. Maybe he needs to do that. That's good for him. But I can handle it. Let him that thing at these stand and take heed lest he fall. I'm glad that God included a lot of these sins of, the, of these great men of God in the Bible. It allows us the opportunity to look at someone else who's done great things for the Lord, to then, even if we foolishly want to compare ourselves to people, we could say, well, look at what this person did for God. Am I on that level? No, but look at what they did. Also, if that person is capable of committing these sins, how would I not be? These people who are, you know, in the eternal word of God and that God has honored in, in many great ways. I'm not in this book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, not, not by name as like the friend of God is. But the man that was the friend of God, the father of faith, he took unto him a concubine and, and had a, a child that yeah, was not according to God's will and allowed that to be a bad decision. You know, I mean, there's, 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 everybody has sins. And we should not think higher of ourselves than any of these. And, and really, let's take heed to the warnings. You could read the book of Proverbs, you know, warnings on adultery and fornication. And my standards do not, are not out of line at all with what the Bible teaches on those things. And if you think I'm crazy for that, you should probably go back and reread those warnings and admonitions and take it seriously and have faith that they are as bad as it says and guard yourself against committing those things. Don't be... Double, you know, compromise ultimately leads or stems from a double-mindedness also. For, uh, James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, I wanted to read this in context because... In context, it's just talking about asking the Lord for wisdom. But the statements given about being double-minded and about being like the wave of the sea that's just driven back and forth and tossed around because of being double-minded and being d unstable in all your ways stands and applies to more things than just asking for wisdom, right? So had Moses been double-minded in his faith, that God was going to deliver, that God was going to protect them, that, you know, that God was going to come through, he would have compromised. He would have been unstable. He would have been like, well, I don't know. I mean, Moses or, or Pharaoh's got all this power and he's his king and he's already been oppressing us so much. If he was double-minded in his faith there, it wouldn't have worked out so well. If you're double-minded on, you know, on anywhere in the scripture, it's not going to work out well for you. You need to decide and be settled on the word of God and not allow these compromises to come in. And obviously a compromise is a double-mindedness. 
And I, I, per and I didn't know if I was going to mention this or not because I don't, I don't like making things too political, but I was taught in school, you know, how great the compromise was. This was lifted up when, when we're learning about government, we're learning about all this stuff, like with this great thing about compromise. Compromise is like a dirty word to me. Seriously. If you think about it, the reason why the you know, compromise is exalted, say, well, you got to give and take and do all this to work together and everything else. But when it comes to righteousness and things that are right, and supposedly that's what the government, you know, you're supposed to have representatives that are going to be representing what's right. You don't compromise on what's right. The ends don't justify the means. You don't say, well, I got this passed through, but I had to give up this. How about we don't give in for any wickedness? I'm not going to promote things that are, that are filthy and vile, and I'm not going to support people who support those things. And we need to make a stand and say, we're not going to compromise. And that's why I hate politics, especially these days. Because at some point, once upon a time, I believe... I don't know this because I wasn't around, but at least from what people were giving off the impression that they had integrity. And people might have had ideas that I disagreed with, but at least they, they held to ideas and principles and would make decisions based on those things as opposed to just who knows what they believe. I'm just going to say what I think people are going to want to hear and, and do whatever and do wicked things and nothing is guiding me and I don't care what's right and wrong. I'm just going to go with... with whatever who knows and that's why it's so hard to support anybody compromise you know and compromise is what leads to you know say well if people didn't compromise in the house and in the senate and all these bills and stuff and nothing would get done you know what i say good we have enough laws we have enough stinking taxes we have enough problems with our government as it is we don't need it getting any bigger how about you stop compromising and stop passing through a bunch of garbage and get rid of half of the, you know, more than half, 90% of the junk that we got going on right now, and we'd be in much better shape. Instead of compromise, oh, well, we want to get this bill through. We want to get this bill. How about you stop getting bills through? I don't know about you, but I was happy when the government was on, you know, when the government shut down. Oh, we can't, we can't sign this budget. Good. Because you keep on spending more money than we have. You keep on selling the future of our children down the river getting us into more and more debt because the government doesn't produce anything. Right. It just taxes its people. And we're already overtaxed to the point of we've got a debt that's unsustainable and it's just going to kill the whole, the whole system. They want to kick the can down the road further and further and like, oh, this is so bad, the government shut down. Shut down the government. If it means you're going to stop spending, great. Oh, but what about people's jobs? You know what? We shouldn't have a whole huge segment of our society relying on the government to provide them jobs. Because like I said, they're not producing anything. The government isn't producing anything. It's not like making some goods and mining and doing work and selling product and do, you know, doing this whole thing like, like we would do to earn an income. They don't do any of that. It's just bureaucracy. We don't need more of that. That was my little pitch. And you know what? I don't care what the, what the stupid laws say about what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say because it's the house of God. And second of all, I'm not even breaking them anyways because I'm not endorsing anybody. <laughs> I don't like any of them. They all stink. Because no one has integrity. You want to tell me Joe Biden has integrity? You want to tell me Donald Trump has integrity? I don't think so. I don't think so. I haven't seen it. They don't believe in principles. Who knows what they believe? Just a bunch of wicked people that like power. No compromise. Don't make a deal with the devil. It's never going to work out in your favor. The Bible says walk in the spirit and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Easier said than done, I know. But don't give in. You know when those moments come. You know when your flesh is going to try to convince you to, to compromise. Well, just this once. Well, 
Don't do it. It's always going to work out against you. And honestly, some of the best victories are made when no compromises are made. That victory of, with, with Moses, I mean, how fundamental and foundational is that victory that just mentioned all throughout the scripture? From no compromise. We don't compromise on the things of God. God will see you through it to the end. Just have the faith. He'll make that victory so much sweeter. Don't fall short. The children of Israel, you know, when they, they were wandering through the wilderness, God had the end in sight and planned out for them already with the oasis and the palm trees and everything else. He knew where he was leading them to. They didn't know. They were complaining, oh man, what are you doing? You're going to bring us out here to kill us and start complaining and everything else. It's like, look, just go a little bit further. Just have that faith. Don't compromise. Don't go back. Don't fall. Just let it keep going. God has you. He'll take care of you. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all that you do for us. Lord, I pray that you please help us to have the, the faith to be able to follow your word completely without compromising. Uh, I'm glad that, that Moses didn't compromise to Pharaoh, and I pray that you please help us to be strong and be strong in our spirit to, uh, to not compromise on our own convictions and our own beliefs and our, our doctrine, dear Lord, uh, just because there's pressure coming on us. Lord, help us to, to beat that pressure with faith in, in your word and in you, and that you would just strengthen us to do what's right every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.